Controls are still offline, sir. Override. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Why is this collapsing star giving up this like glowing lumpy asteroid thing? <laughs> Oh god, I love the 80s so much. <laughs> All right, so I have a little bit of a confession to make, and that is that I've never seen any of the original Star Trek series. I know, I know, and I call myself a massive sci-fi fan as well. I just, I mean, I've always been more of a Star Wars gal, what can I say? Now, I have seen the films with Chris Pine and Aimer, which I enjoyed a lot, which I don't know if that redeems me in the eyes of all the Trekkies watching or not, but I figured time to redeem myself. It's streaming on Netflix now, we're in lockdown here in the UK, so there is no better time for me to start watching them. And also I figured, you know, I should record my reaction as well as an astrophysicist, 100% inspired by Dr. Mike's Doctor Reacts series. I found that through my obsession with Grey's Anatomy and I thought it'd be you know, something fun to do over here as well. And this is not sci-fi bashing in any way. I'm very aware that you need the fiction part to make it science fiction and that's what makes it fun. I'm just kind of reacting in the sense of, okay, if these programmers were bound by the real laws of physics, then how would it be different? So without any further ado, let's get into this. This is me reacting to Star Trek, The Next Generation, season one, episode two, The Naked Now. Captain's log, stardate 41209.2. We are running at warp seven to rendezvous with the science vessel SS Tsiolkovsky, which has been routinely monitoring the collapse of a red supergiant star into a white dwarf. Wait, hang on, okay, so <laughs> we've already got some astro happening here and it's not even like 20 seconds in. So uh, he just said that they are looking at this star, apparently a red supergiant star that's gonna collapse into a white dwarf. Red supergiants don't collapse into white dwarfs, they collapse into neutron stars. It's just the plain old red giants that collapse into white dwarfs. So that's anything that when it's a normal star, it's something from like half the mass of the sun to eight times the mass of the sun will become a red giant and then a white dwarf. Anything bigger, so like eight times the mass of the sun to say like 30 or so times the mass of the sun, that's going to become a red supergiant star and then collapse into a neutron star. And it just all depends like how big the normal star is when it's happily turning hydrogen into helium through nuclear fusion in what it becomes at the end of its life. And I guess here they just thought that red supergiant sounded more impressive than just red giant, but it's the kind of thing I'd expect a program like Star Trek to get right. The scans now reveal no life science aboard, Captain. Yeah, so, so this is the thing. So red giants, red super giants, both of them, they're just really unstable stars, right? They're at the end of their life. They've not got a lot of fuel left. They're basically hanging on for as long as they can and trying all the tricks in the book to like, you know, instead of fuse hydrogen into helium, they're fusing helium into heavier elements and carbon into heavier elements. And so they're really unstable. They, they tend to pulse as well. They're not like sort of static like you see here. And also they're throwing off a huge amount of material into space in what we call like a stellar wind. It's just sort of streaming off it. And they're incredibly, incredibly hot too. So I don't know how close you'd actually be able to, to get. Like I don't think you'd be able to get this close to a red giant star. But yeah, maybe this, this star's more stable. Maybe that's why they've been able to monitor it. I'll just keep watching. <laughs> Oh, I really like this opening, like flying past all the planets. Yeah, there's something, come on, something. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages. Did you see that though there? How the foreground stars moved with respect to the background stars? That's really cool. That's something we call parallax. So I'm really glad that they actually put that in the opening sequence because that was one of the first ways that we were able to calculate distance to, to stars in our nearby universe. So if you think about how we move in our orbit on Earth around the sun, right? So our perspective on stars changes. And so you see 
like foreground stars that are closer to you move with respect to the background stars, whether you look at them, you know, from, from winter on one side of the sun, and when you're on the other side of the sun in summer, you look at them and, and see them from a different angle. And so then it's just like some really simple like trigonometry, like what you learn at school to work out the distances to, to stars that are nearby. And so it's really cool that they put that in the, the opening sequence, you know, that's a, that's a little detail that I, that I appreciate. <laughs> to boldly go where no one has gone before. And then they make the jump to warp speed, light speed, hyperspeed, whatever they call it in Star Trek, right? Like, I, just to point out that under our current understanding of the laws of physics, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. It's incredibly difficult to accelerate something even close to the speed of light. You need an incredible, incredible amount of energy. The only things that we can currently do it with are, you know, tiny particles like protons in these incredible particle accelerators like the LHC at CERN. So I think we're a long way off from ships like that that can travel at those those huge, huge speeds, unfortunately. We are downloading the research information gathered on the collapsing star nearby. I am concerned at being in such close orbit, but that Tsiolkovsky's research records will no doubt predict the time of the star's final collapse. Okay, so Magneto is as concerned as I am about their relatively close orbit to this star. That makes me feel better. But one thing he said there about predicting the, the time that the star will collapse. I mean, maybe in the future, if you're studying it this close, this close in orbit, you might be able to get at that detail. But like stars spend anything from thousands of years to millions of years in these red giant phases before they become white dwarfs. So like pinpointing a time that that's going to happen is pretty difficult. You know, like the best thing you can say is that it could be tomorrow. It could be in a million years. Like look at Betelgeuse, for example. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star coming to the end of its life. It could go supernova and become a neutron star any day. <laughs> We've been saying that for decades now. So... It's anyone's guess. I'm getting very strange reports from all decks. Such as? Such as the ship's training division ordering all officers to attend a lecture on metaphysics. Metaphysics? So, fun fact, metaphysics is not actually a branch of physics. It's actually philosophy. And in it, they ask questions like, you know, how do we exist? Why do we exist? What does it mean to exist? I've never studied it myself, but I imagine it hurts the brain a lot. More than astrophysics does <laughs> the brain anyway. And there was a rather peculiar limerick being delivered by someone in the shuttlecraft bay. I am not sure I understand it. There was a young lady from Venus whose body was shaped like a- <laughs> Captain to security, come in! <laughs> oh, I'm stealing that one. <laughs> Maybe it's mutated. But I've got to isolate it in order to analyze it. We don't it. have that kind of time. You brought Deanna in. Yes, she's infected Then you with touched it. her. Oh, God, and you touched me. Wait, I've Just got to quarantine you. Stop touching each other. Stop touching each other in the workplace as well. Like, it's not that hard. God, this, this episode's hitting a little bit too close to home in 2020. <gasps> Sir, the star is beginning to collapse. So you see how the star changed colour then? It went from sort of a, a reddish colour to a yellowish colour. That is actually what would happen like in real life, right? If you could watch this kind of process happening. Because it's all to do with what's going on inside the star itself, in the very core where the nuclear fusion is happening, right? You've got this core of, of hydrogen that's been turned into helium when the star was in its normal phase. And now you've only got nuclear fusion going on in this little sort of like shell around the outside where it's currently hot enough. It's kind of like an onion or something, right? And so there's this constant battle between nuclear fusion pushing outwards with all the energy it produces and then gravity like pushing inwards. And eventually you use up all of the hydrogen, or whether it's doing helium burning perhaps as well, in that shell around the outside. And then all of a sudden there's no energy pushing back outwards again. Gravity starts to win. The star contracts a little bit, but then all of a sudden it gets hot enough to kickstart more hydrogen or helium burning around the outside in these shells again. And so you've got this constant, this is where you get this like pulsing as well. But as it contracts, the star gets hotter. And so it changes colour. It goes from red to yellow because yellow is hotter than red, which 
might be weird to some of you because like you know like taps have been telling us for ages right that red is hot and then like blue is cold but actually the blue end of the spectrum of like the color spectrum of the blue end of the rainbow is the hottest think about it like um you know the flame on a gas cooker or hob or in a Bunsen burner is blue, right? But the flame on a candle or like the dying embers of a fire is much more yellowy red, right? It, it, it's much cooler. And so as the star contracts and get hotter, it will go sort of from, from red to yellow to, to blue to white eventually. So yeah, red is the colder end of the rainbow and blue is the hotter end of the rainbow. All right, so this red giant star is now becoming a white dwarf, right? And it's undergoing collapse, as they said. I don't think collapse is necessarily the right word here. I mean, they didn't show a supernova, which is right. You wouldn't get a supernova, but collapse isn't right either. Like I said, these, these stars are like pulsating and they're losing a lot of their material all the time to the space around them. So in the sort of however many millions of years that this star spent in its red giant phase, it probably would have shedded about 50 up to 70 percent of its outer layers of all that gas in into space until essentially all you're left with is just the inner helium core left over from nuclear fusion at the center, which is the white dwarf. And they leave behind these most spectacular nebula we call planetary nebula that just look incredible you can see you know all the regions around it where all this gas from these pulsations where it's ended up with and I think that actually would have been more spectacular to show on screen if they decided to show that but I guess they needed like immediate danger from the star throwing off all of its material and its outer layers all at once which would have been more like a, a typical supernova but you know you wouldn't have got a white dwarf at the end you would have got something like a, a neutron star or even a black hole if you were lucky. Controls are still offline, sir. Override. What's that? <laughs> Why is this collapsing star giving up this like glowing lumpy asteroid thing? <laughs> oh god, I love the 80s so much. <laughs> Seriously though, if this star had actually, you know, thrown all its outer layers off at once, it would have done that in, you know, a sphere of gas that expanded outward. It wouldn't have been in some weird lumpy rock. It would have been like, you know, like a shockwave traveling through space. But this is science fiction. And in science fiction, apparently collapsing stars do little glowy asteroid <laughs> poops. Also, they said they were in orbit around this star before, right? So if that star collapsed, you know, the Enterprise's orbit is going to be massively affected by that. It wouldn't stay there at all. You know, it would get flung away, kind of like, um, you know, like a discus thrower when they spin around and then they let go of it and it goes off in a straight line. Like if you change the amount of mass that's in the center by, by throwing off all of those outer layers, then you're going to change that gravitational field. Enterprise is going to get flung off to safety probably, to be honest. So... You know, they wouldn't be stuck around waiting for a big lump of glowing, poopy asteroid to hit them. 94, mark 37, sir. Engage. Well, there you have it. My very first Star Trek episode. I kind of enjoyed it. And at least I'll get all the Wesley Crusher references they make on the Big Bang Theory now. <laughs> but if there are any other episodes of Star Trek, either TNG or any of the series that you want me to watch, or there are any other sci-fi programs or films you want me to react to, let me know down in the comments below. Oh, um... Netflix is about to play another episode and you know what? Go on, I'll just, I'll just watch another one, it's fine. <laughs> a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem solving website with interactive courses on a huge range of science and maths topics that get you to learn by doing. Whether you want to be more like Data from Star Trek and brush up on the principles of logic, or maybe you want to learn more about how we measure distances with parallax, like in the opening sequence of The Next Generation, or maybe you want to learn more about how stars evolve through normal stars to red giants to white dwarfs, like we just saw in that episode. Well, Brilliant has got you covered. Their courses teach you to work through problems and get you thinking like a scientist in no time. So if that sounds like fun to you and there's something new that you want to learn, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up completely 
for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So by clicking on that link, you let them know that I sent you. So go ahead and sign up and say a big thank you to Brilliant from me. See, in case you were wondering, this, this is how I focus when I'm alone in the house with this adorable, adorable cat pillow. <laughs> Oh, it does make me laugh that he's called Geordie, this character. Like, if you're in the UK, you'll know a Geordie is someone who comes from Newcastle. And half my family come from up from Newcastle, and I bloody love him. And they all talk like this, like, oh, Geordie, man, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you sick, man? <laughs> Just, every time they call him Geordie, that's all that I can think of.